Grande to Rio de Janeiro, return to the center and from Aztec to high tech. Uh, Herzog has, has been to Fulbright Scholar in Peru and the United Kingdom and has lectured at universities in Mexico, Peru, Brazil, France, Spain, Holland, it Italy, Luxembourg and the United Kingdom. He speaks fluent Spanish and Portuguese. Um, Herzog has served as urban regional planning consultant to the US Agency for International Development, the American Institu uh, Development, the American Institute of Architects, the US Embassy to Mexico, the US consultant, Tijuana, uh, the Public Policy Institute of California and the California De uh, Department of Transportation. Um, I'll turn it over to Herzog to. Thank you. Thanks All right, that. Sure, yes. uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Renee and the faculty and staff and administration in the Gibbs uh, College of Architecture at the University of Oklahoma for inviting me to speak in this lecture series. I would much rather come to Oklahoma. Uh, I've never been to the University of Oklahoma. So uh, after hearing that list of all the places I've given lectures, I was thinking to myself, wow, I've spoken all over the world, but I've not actually spoken at the University of Oklahoma. So uh, hopefully someday I'll make it there to see to meet you all in person. Um, so what I'd like to do today is um, couple of things. Um, I'm going to be talking about the book that's pictured on this first slide, which is a, a book called Global Suburbs that uh, is, is about a larger issue uh, of something I call global sprawl or global suburbs. But specifically, I'm going to focus on the work that I did uh, in Rio de Janeiro. So uh, let me um, Talk, uh, show the outline here. So basically what I want to do is uh, start out by talking a little bit about the background to why I wrote the book, a kind of conceptual context for this idea of global sprawl. And then I want to uh, focus in on defining what I mean by the global suburb and also specifically why I think the kind of uh, what I call the suburban narrative, if you will, the cultural narrative uh, sort of, of of what a suburb, global suburb is in terms of its architectural and urban design components is an important thing for us to be talking about in the 21st century. Uh, um, I'll, I'll briefly show some examples of global suburbs, and then I'll focus in on Latin America and its peripheries in a globalizing area, era and talk, uh, and finally uh, start to talk about Rio de Janeiro. What I discovered about global sprawl in the metropolitan area of Rio de Janeiro, and then um, then I'm gonna kind of turn it around and talk about some of the lessons from the city of Rio de Janeiro, the actual urban neighborhoods in the urban core of Rio and some of the urban design lessons that uh, could be used to rethink the future growth of places like Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And finally, I'll <clears throat> conclude with some um, policy directions and uh, some urban design scenarios um, briefly. So uh, let me begin by talking about uh, the context for why I wrote the book, some of the sort of conceptual ideas that have been uh, circulating around in our field over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, so the, uh, I asked myself, or we can ask ourselves, you know, what are the forces that threaten the sustainability of 21st century cities? So I'm speaking generally about cities across the planet and I'm going to use some examples from North America, but then I'm going to show how those examples apply in Latin America. So the urbanism that we are experiencing and the, the, the challenges that we experience in the United States uh, are also similar to challenges that are being experienced in other parts of the world and specifically in Latin America and specifically in Brazil and Rio de Janeiro. So the first general category is what I call fast urbanism. There's a lot of literature uh, in the last uh, 20 years that speaks to uh, the different ways in which machines, automobile travel, uh, technology in general, <clears throat> the internet <clears throat> as well has kind of sped up people's lives. <clears throat> and so I asked the question and others have asked the question as well, what does this 
moving at very fast pace or feeling like you have to accomplish things very quickly, which is in many ways very good. And all that technology has created so many advantages that we all know about, but there are also costs. And I think there are costs in terms of urban design, planning and architecture <clears throat> that we maybe haven't sufficiently investigated. So I'm interested in how those ideas play out in a very specific way that I'll talk about. But that's one of the background kind of theoretical areas. And then of course, probably the biggest issue which has been written about a lot in the last five or 10 years, a lot of books are coming out about the way in which cyberspace and the internet um, creates many advantages, but also uh, causes a kind of disconnect, uh, the a sort of um, um, perhaps uh, a, a distancing of people from the, the built environment and from the physical environment around them because uh, the computer allows us to do so many things sort of independent of physical space. We become somewhat buffered. It also creates advantages, of course. It gives us a lot of information. So we can, if we can use it well, and there's a lot of books being written about how we can use technology and digital information to enhance our understanding of the physical environment and our relationship to it. So there's a, a good side, a yin and a yang, if you will. Uh, but I'm concerned about the disconnect side of it and how that is perhaps part of the story that I'm trying to weave in, in, in the book I wrote and also subsequently in further research that I'm uh, working on. In fact, a new book that follows up on some of the ideas from the one I wrote uh, in 2015. So of course, the other issue is the automobile, which is so, so dominant in our urbanism. We have a kind of autocentric uh, style of building cities in North America. Uh, and I think that also is obviously responsible for this very horizontal sprawl pattern that's been created and other environmental problems that many other scholars have been writing about as well. This is something that I came across in my research and I wrote about in the book, which is this sort of idea of speed and time as part of a kind of Western culture, linear view of time as being this finite precious resource and how uh, we've created sort of whole entire systems of management theory, something called Taylorism, which is about how to optimize production in factories and the whole focus on taking advantage of those seven hours or eight hours inside this building and what you could do to create a consistent, structurally uh, repeatable kind of way in which management would uh, be uh, turned out into various different types of work settings, uh, which is fine, except that's not the only way to think about time and not the only way to uh, imagine urban, uh, urban design. So in fact, the idea that time is linear can be um, you know, questioned. In fact, uh, there are other philosophies that suggest that time is also cyclical. And if we uh, imagine how that might apply to urban design, we start to think in different ways, particularly about the environment, the, the idea that the environment, in fact, the ecosystem is not a linear process at all, but in fact, it's a very cyclical process. So we really have to rethink our notions of time and space and design. And then the last thing, another thing that I came across was the fact that one of the reasons why people are, 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 are so frantic and, and, uh, and why movement, the flow of people and why uh, particularly United, in the United States, why there's so, so much the sense of very increasingly fast paced life is because of the transformation of work and how the average work week uh, in North America has gone from 40 to as high as 60 hours a week. A lot of people are working over 40 hours a week. And so they have very little leisure time. And so what little time they have, they want to get things done quickly. They wanna move quickly in their vehicles. They want to optimize time and this perhaps changes the way people relate to the built environment, particularly if they're living farther and farther away from uh, urban nuclei, from centers that they need to get to, then they're constantly trying to drive fast, move fast, and that causes all sorts of other problems. Um, and then another thing that I think is important and is part of what I would call the suburban cultural narrative is the uh, increasing homogenization of the built environment. So, um, shopping uh, corporate control over consumerism, uh, big box uh, centers and mega centers. And the uh, fact that in the United States, there's a lot more square feet of commercial space per person as we look uh, across time from the uh, late 20th century into the 21st century. So uh, this homogenization process is also, I think something worrisome because it's even more reproduced in, um, in suburban settings. 
And it's a global phenomenon that's seen in certain types of uh, consumer behaviors that have also become globalized as well. Uh, but Taylorism is another form of homogenization. So homogenization not only occurs in what we consume, but also in, also in the way in which we build, build out the built environment. And this goes all the way back to the 1950s when Taylorism was applied by the Levitt Company to the building of the first suburbs in the United States. They created a very Taylorist like assembly line approach to building suburbs. It was all standardized lot layouts, standardized community designs, very monotonous packaged landscapes. And that type of morphology did not allow for walking. It was very auto-centric and it became the dominant paradigm for the building of these horizontal cookie cutter suburbs across the United States. Now, this is not a, a new theme. This is nothing surprising, but I kind of went back and looked at some of the sort of, uh, I, I tried to deconstruct it and looked at some of these issues that I thought are, became part of what I understood to be the driving cultural force that was adopted uh, across Latin America. And it showed up in my interviews in Brazil when I started studying the, the uh, suburban growth uh, outside of Rio de Janeiro. And of course, then you have the Richard Sennett view, the fall of public man. He wrote that back in 1974. And he talked about how, um, you know, in the 20th century, as we created more technology and more ways to use automobiles instead of public transit, that people began to retreat into the personal space of their family and they became more fearful of public space. Uh, he said the stranger himself is a threatening figure. Few people take great pleasure in the world of strangers in the cosmopolitan city. So loss of public space and a retreating into private space is also part of this story of the cultural narrative of suburbs. And this privatization literally shows up in this kind of a built environment where people have individual houses. There are no real places to walk to. There's not a lot of interaction, not a lot of social spaces where people can congregate other than shopping centers. Uh, and so the built environment shifts from being more civic oriented in the previous centuries to one in which uh, it's more private, privacy oriented. Uh, and this one of the out comes of this massive homogenization and produce, production of uh, these uh, cookie cutter suburbs is um, you know, illustrated by this book, The McDonaldization of Society and the idea uh, that it then spreads to the built environment and creates this place destruction and loss of identity. So suburbs that all look the same, very placeless. This has also been written about quite a bit. So moving over to Latin America, I then took this idea of some of the pernicious uh, aspects of suburbs that were in the literature, that have been in the literature for a very long time. Uh, and I began to think about, well, uh, to what extent does this kind of suburbanization, is that, has it become a phenomenon in Latin America? Uh, Latin America, the periphery of most Latin American cities, as I'll talk about in a second, more typically is known for being a place where poor people have moved because they have no other choices. So they're forced to build, um, you know, uh, these squatter settlements or unregulated uh, urbanization uh, schemes because they can't afford to buy into the existing market. But at the same time, something else has been going on as well that's actually competing with the poor who are trying to just survive living in their um, spontaneous settlements that they've built on the outskirts of cities. So what's happened is that in Latin America, um, the uh, developers got the idea that people might want some of the things that they saw in American suburbs middle class and upper middle class suburbs in the United States and Canada and other places were attractive to Latin Americans who were watching what was going on in the US. And there's also been some literature out there in academia about this phenomenon, about people seeing the model of uh, the American suburb as, as a positive thing. So the, uh, it's the automobile oriented, the low density, uh, single use zoning, the separation of different districts for shopping offices and residential spaces and the building of freeways and collective roads. So that that's part of the American suburb, but it's also something that was of interest in other parts of the world. So this suburban model, if you will, this low density, single use, auto centric, the curvy linear street pattern, that's the American, that's the North American model. Um, it's not entirely copied in Latin America, but the idea of the US style suburb is exported to Latin America. And I call that a socio-cultural narrative 
that's what they're copying, not the exact design because they're not building the low density, single family individual houses, but they are building malls and they are creating gated communities. A lot of times they're using mid rise and high rise buildings instead because they have uh, higher density to start with. And so people are living at higher densities in general. And I'll talk in a moment in Brazil that in fact, that's, um, that's actually what the upper classes choose to do is to live above the street, away from the street, as high up as possible in the very luxurious um, private condominiums. So they are attracted to the social exclusivity of the suburbs, the private rather than public spaces, this fear of crime is part of what's going on. You know, Mike Davis talked about the fear of crime and social policing. I think that's a factor in Latin America as well. And even this preference for this homogenized built environments, these shopping malls that are um, literally copied from the American model and reproduced throughout Latin America, and especially in Brazil and Argentina and some of the wealthier countries of the Southern Cone. And also this emphasis on con consumerism and these somewhat artificial landscapes are also being copies as, as, as well. Um, and there are a lot of ecological problems we know in suburbs across the planet. Uh, I talk about four in the book. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but obviously uh, there are problems uh, such as air pollution. Freeways, uh, living near freeways has been shown to create uh, toxic air that's much more dangerous uh, for people who live within a certain distance of freeways. The incidence of traffic accidents, um, the way in which uh, during uh, rush hour, people are frustrated, they drive faster. Apparently, uh, studies have shown that the um, traffic death rate and traffic accident rate in communities that have freeways is much higher than in those that don't. Uh, and then we, in the United States, we have a lot of public health research being done. Uh, there was a wonderful um, panel yesterday at UC San Diego on uh, transportation after the pandemic and talking about the problems of uh, public health in communities where people don't walk. People are living in sprawl and there have been numerous studies of metropolitan areas and the uh, negative effects of sprawl on people's health. So the biggest one was a study of 83 metropolitan areas, over 200,000 adults, showing that people who live in sprawl communities actually have higher rates of obesity, which leads to higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, and heart attacks and other health problems. So we know that this kind of lifestyle is not healthy. And also there was this, um, this whole idea of social capital that's lost. What is lost when you're living in these very low densities, when you're living in places that are um, so spread out? And what, one of the things that's lost is spontaneously bumping into people. Um, this was highlighted in Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone back in 2000, talking about the collapse of American communities uh, because of the way in which people had moved away from their traditional ability to bump into each other and have institutions and places where they could connect on a regular basis. Okay, so um, so what? If, where where are these global suburbs? This this American copying American suburban models are are showing up in everywhere from Argentina to South Africa to Egypt, China. Hong Kong, Mexico City, we're seeing different forms of this kind of global suburb. Again, it's much higher density. It's not as low density, single family like as in the United States, but the ideas and the built environment, the way in which it reflects this socio-cultural narrative that I talked about is very, very powerful. So here's the um, development plan for a community, a suburban community outside Cairo, Egypt, and they literally take names of American places and use them to name their suburbs. So this one is called Beverly Hills uh, outside of Cairo, Egypt. Um, here's a McMansion in another uh, development outside of Beijing, which is called Orange County, um, you know, pulling the California uh, example. This is a well-known mega suburb outside of Mexico City called Santa Fe. Again, you can see it's much higher density, but it has very similar uh, this social cultural narrative of shopping malls and um, um, you know exclusivity, kind of keeping out outsiders, making it very exclusive for certain social classes. Uh, here's a gated home and outside of Hong Kong in an enclave. So now I want to kind of come to the main part of the story, which is to talk about Latin America and then specifically about what happened in Brazil. So I want to point, I want to be clear that most of the research on the transformation of the peripheries of Latin America 
goes back to the 20th century and the phenomenon of uh, squatter communities or asentamientos irregulares, irregular settlement, these giant waves of people moving from rural areas to smaller towns to medium-sized cities and eventually to the large city uh, in a kind of stepwise migration pattern as it was called back in the uh, research that was done uh, in the late 19. Not, uh, late 1900s from after 1950. Um, this was the and is the biggest uh, phenomenon on the periphery of Latin America and other parts of the world as well. So from the 1940s through the 2000s, we had these waves of rural to urban, town to city uh, migrations occurring and an increasingly massive geographic segregation between the, the rich and the poor. So wealthy people lived either in communities closer to the center of the city or in gated enclaves in certain parts of the uh, outside of the downtown. And then every other area outside the city, moving further and further away, you would have these waves and waves of um, irregular settlements built by people who couldn't afford to rent or bought, bought purchase land in the city. So they would you know, engage in invade land invasions or purchase land sometimes illegally from uh, developers or uh, landowners. Or sometimes they weren't even the actual landowners. Many different things that went on with a lot of insecurity, very insecure kind of urbanism. And it continues today, but it's partially being eclipsed by this new phenomenon, which is what I wanna talk about. So the new phenomenon is what happened since 2000. And there are basically two trends in Latin America. One is the building of gated communities and fenced suburbs that have spread around where the squatter communities uh, have located. So anywhere where there are open parcels of land were bought up by developers, fenced off and uh, taken advantage of uh, as potential um, American style suburban developments. And a second type of project that's uh, appeared in the last 20 years in Latin America is these so-called elite mega projects, these giant sort of enclaves that are mixed use projects with offices, mega malls and high rise condominiums. So uh, those are the two things that are changing the periphery. So these gated residential suburbs, uh, one uh, Chilean scholar referred to them as archipelagos of gated spaces, automobile oriented upper and middle income enclaves. Uh, another scholar has referred to this as small scale segregation. So what's happening is, and you can see in one of those photographs uh, on, on one side, you have the elite condominiums uh, uh, with tennis courts and swimming pools. And then on the other side, you have the uh, lower density squatter communities. And again, uh, on the, uh, uh, in the photograph uh, below, you have this uh, suburban uh, medium to low density on the right-hand side of that slide. And then the left-hand side, you have the much higher density uh, 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 colonias and, 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 and squatter settlements. So um, these are growing toward the suburbs, not always right next to the colonias or the favelas as they're called in Brazil, but often they're side by side. Um, and they have different names in Latin America. They're called in Argentina, they're called barrios privados. In Chile, condominios. In Ecuador, urbanizaciones cerradas, closed urbanization. And in Brazil, they're also called closed condominiums, condominios fechados. And in Mexico, they're called fraccionamientos cerrados, or uh, they have other names as well. Um, so the mega projects are these giant kind of edge cities, similar to the ones that were built in the United States, where you had hotels and high tech and commerce all coming together in the suburbs, and you're finding them in, um, in Latin America as well. A couple of well-known examples in, um, in Mexico. I mentioned Santa Fe, also outside of Puebla as a is a development called Angelopolis. And then the one I'm gonna talk about in Rio de Janeiro is Baja da Tijuca. Okay, so let's move on to Brazil. Um, so I wanna talk about Rio de Janeiro, but I wanna uh, first as background, talk about the place which is probably the one that's been written about the most until I started working on um, Rio. Uh, the, the, a lot of the literature focused on Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao Paulo is probably the city that's most well known for its um, vertical suburbs. Uh, Sao Paulo in general, if you've ever been there, is a, is a highly vertical 
uh, uh, built environment oriented city. The entire metropolitan area is mostly high rise uh, buildings uh, with the exception of uh, the favelas, which are the only low rise buildings around and they're usually very far away from the city or in certain pockets, flood prone uh, river basins, et cetera. Um, so it's a city where the contrast between uh, high rise is usually more middle, upper, and wealthy classes living in these high-rise buildings versus the low-rise, which are the favelas and the lower-income families. So um, this is a, a subject that um, really goes back to uh, Brazil falling in love with the idea of the garden suburb, which was a kind of modernist idea that came out of Europe, was uh, very much promoted by uh, you know architects like Le Corbusier going before uh, the modernists, even back to the utopian uh, ideas of uh, various writers at the end of the 19th century, the, so the garden city, Ebenezer Howard from the UK uh, talked about garden cities and some of them were actually built. And so this idea of a high rise standalone tower, modernist kind of walled safe uh, garden suburb was very attractive uh, <clears throat> in, in when then there was a uh, couple of uh, versions of that were built early in the history of Sao Paulo. So some of the first garden suburbs were built in Sao Paulo. And then of course, the, um, the modernist capital of Brasilia kind of took that idea and, and um, uh, Lucio Costa, the urban designer, kind of designed an entire city around the idea of creating these neighborhoods that he called super quadras or super blocks, these super block neighborhoods uh, in, in his airplane shaped uh, vision of the city where the, the wings of the airplane were the two residential sectors and then the, uh, the main uh, cabin, if you will, of the center of the airplane would be where all the other uses would be the, the ministries, the government buildings, the commercial and tourism zones and so forth. So he had a very modernist, very kind of um, uh, organized idea about construction and built environment. So this is something that um, was very popular in Latin America and especially in Brazil. Um, they loved Le Corbusier, they liked his ideas. They didn't, uh, he didn't actually design very many buildings. I think he only has one building that was actually built in Latin America, but his ideas and the ideas of modernists were extremely popular in Brazil. And Sao Paulo being the largest city was one of the places where that happened. Now, the problems of um, building high rise, exclusive high rise buildings and then leaving the favelas as the low rise urbanism, this contrast and segregation was the subject of a very important uh, work by Teresa Caldera, who was um, uh, wrote a book called City of Walls, in which she talked about this relationship of rupture and denial with the rest of the city, that residents who live in these high rise buildings literally reject the idea of community. So this is, I think, the first important kind of building block of the sort of um, built environment problems of building these high rise gated suburbs in cities on the outskirts of um, Latin American cities and all the social issues that, um, that one finds. Uh, so Caldera said that in Sao Paulo, people are retreating into a world of privacy and security in tall towers away from the streets. And this is a, a view of um, sort of from downtown uh, Sao Paulo looking out across the landscape of the city and it's just massive series of high-rise residential suburbs that go on and on for you know literally a uh, hundred square miles it's it's a, one of the most visually powerful places I've been to in terms of the high-rise urbanism as it moves further and further from the center of the city and one of the things that that's created is this incredible obsession really with privatization and security. Everywhere you go, you see signs like this that say this is uh, this condominium is being monitored by uh, security cameras. The, the images are transmitted to a central place where we, we're basically watching over you. Um, so these privatized spaces, um, they're not environmentally friendly um, and e not even controlled by a public agency. These are private companies that control all the security, all the footage. So anytime you're walking around in any of these suburbs, someone's watching you and it's not even an elected official or a representative of the government. These are private companies that monitor the streets. So this creates a very odd sort of lifestyle. And, um, you know, uh, 
I went to Sao Paulo to take a look at these suburbs and I <clears throat> interviewed various people. And, uh, you know, uh, one business person told me Sao Paulo is not interested in the tradition of meeting in public places. Paulistas are much more private, uh, as opposed to other places in Brazil where <clears throat> there is still more of a public spirit, civic spirit, if you will. And Morimbi is one of the suburbs, the, uh, the, the newer uh, high-rise suburbs uh, outside of Sao Paulo and Teresa Caldera wrote about it. She said to walk in Morimbi is a stigma. The pedestrian is seen as poor and suspicious. So people don't even walk. They're either in their cars or they're in their private high-rise um, you know, residential buildings uh, away from the streets. A very worrisome trend indeed. So <clears throat> let me take you to Rio de Janeiro now, the subject of my case study. <clears throat> and I wanna start by just talking a little bit about the growth of Rio, the urbanization of Rio de Janeiro. So we have an understanding of where the suburbs were built and sort of why and what the larger context of the city is. So this map is a very powerful map. First of all, it makes you understand why when the uh, explorers came, they thought this was a river. It's not a river, but that's why they called it the city of January. They arrived in January, they looked, they saw this opening and they thought it was a river. So they named the city, the river of January, Rio de Janeiro, but it's not a river, it's a bay, a very large bay. The urbanization of Rio, this is downtown, this is the historic center here, is basically divided between <clears throat> what's called the Zona Norte and the Zona Sul, the North Zone and the South Zone. The pink areas are all the uh, urbanization and the green is Rio de Janeiro, if you've ever been there, is a uh, topographically quite dramatic city. So you have these mountains coming out of the uh, Mata Atlantica, the, the Atlantic rainforest that drains right toward the sea. And you have all these rivers and streams that drain uh, toward the ocean and toward the bay. And so a lot of the um, the land around Rio de Janeiro is not buildable because it's extremely, um, uh, it's all mountainous and covered in jungle. So um, the city has grown in the places where land was available to build on. So essentially what has happened in the city is the first big growth around downtown was toward the north. Uh, and this is the biggest uh, urbanization of, uh, of, the, uh, of the city was toward the north. Uh, and that occurred uh, you know, early in the city's history in the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. And as le less land became available and also as uh, wealthier uh, individuals realized that the Rio had this rich coastline that it could uh, perhaps exploit, uh, the problem was getting from downtown to the coast, it's, it, there's a mountain range that runs literally right through the center of the city. So they had to basically dynamite out and build tunnels through the mountains and eventually they did in the 1950s, they built the first tunnel and it opened up these neighborhoods here in an area called Botafogo. So this was the first uh, move away from the downtown out toward the bay here. And eventually they built another set of tunnels and they were able to get through. And finally they got to this area, which is Copacabana. So they were able to build uh, uh, urbanizations in Copacabana and eventually um, they extended the highway around this giant uh, humanly constructed lake called Lagoa and opened up uh, the area of Ipanema, which is here. So this is the first big wave of development from the 40s and 50s through the 80s. Um, and as all this land was used up, and you can see again, there's a lot of mountains, uh, and this is called the Tijuca Forest, which runs, comes right into the city here. So there's no more room for development. So uh, meanwhile, um, uh, by the way, the North Zone is also where the airport is and a lot of the factories. So it's a less desirable part of the city to live. And so as more people have moved here, uh, you either have favelas up in the hills around the North Zone, or you have these what are called railroad suburbs. There were some rail lines built here out in this direction. And these are uh, working class areas, uh, less attractive, a lot more air pollution on the north side of the city, a little bit like Mexico City, if you know Mexico City. Um, so less desirable part of the city increasingly became the North Zone. So there's tremendous sort of uh, socioeconomic um, segregation uh, uh, or distribution of wealth with more of the wealth moving to the south and less toward the north. So the more favelas are in the North Zone, more uh, working class and poor living in the North Zone, very densely populated, um, uh, precarious settlements up in these hills, up along the hills above uh, 
the north zone as well. And also there are favelas in the south zone as well, uh, up in the hills above the communities along the coast. So uh, in the 1980s, uh, the city decided that there was no more land to build here, so they wanted to exploit this here, this area here. And so they hired Lucio Costa, the uh, urban planner for Brasilia, to do a plan for this part of the city, which is where Baja da Tijuca is. So this is um, the new suburban area of Rio. Uh, it's the place that, uh, that I studied in, in my work. So um, again, this is a, a sort of a little bit less accurate map, but it does give you a sense of how downtown expands and it gives you a sense of the mountains, the way in which Rio is defined by the mountainous topography that comes right into the city uh, everywhere, even in the south zone. So, uh, you know, urbanization in the south zone, there, you have all these mountains and peaks around here, so it makes it much harder. Uh, there was no more land to build once uh, Ipanema, Leblon got built out here. Once all of this area, Botafogo, Umaita, Jardim Botanico, all these areas got built out. Copacabana gets built out. There's favelas on the hills around this community. In fact, one of the largest favelas is Cojocinha, which is here. Uh, once this all gets built out, you build another tunnel through these mountains, and now you have a highway access to this new suburban area called Baja da Tijuca. At the same time, as I show in my, my book, there was an increasingly an appetite for a suburban lifestyle. So they hire Lucio Costa to build this new development. And so he says he wants Baja da Tijuca to be um, tied to the lagoons and the waterways and the ocean, because it's a very ecologically interesting, but also fragile um, area. But he, he sees it as an independent city, a little bit like the way he saw Brasilia as a new city. So he took his kind of Brasilia mindset and he adapted it to uh, this piece of land that he was given the plan to do. And he said he wanted it to be the most beautiful, a mais bela cidade oceânica do mundo, the most beautiful ocean city in the world. But it was going to be an enclave, a place to escape. Uh, and it ended up being uh, a massive development of closed condominiums. Now, I should point out that when Lucio Costa designed his plan, he did have this idea to make the plan equitable, that different income groups would be, uh, there would be access housing of different prices uh, along the uh, entire stretch of uh, Baja de Tijuca and also inland into another area. You'll see the plan in a moment that he, that he drew. So here's his pilot plan. So what he wanted to do was create a series of developments along the ocean, trying to preserve uh, this is called a double barrier lagoon. So you have this piece of land here, and then you have this interior piece of land as well. And so this is a very ecologically fragile area. He wanted to create, you see the, he uses the same airplane-like plan here. This is the wing. This is the main axis here. And at the meeting point, he created this giant civic space. Um, he was also going to um, create separate zones for housing, commerce, and offices, like he did in Brasilia. And he has these two axes, axes with the horizontal area, the civic meeting space. So it has the same modernist rationality as Brasilia, the same airplane-like uh, morphology. The only problem, of course, is this is on the coast, right on the beach here, with lagoons. It's very beautiful. And so what happens is land developers realize that they can buy up this land as it's being developed and the price just gets driven way up. So at some point, it's no longer accessible to those other social classes that Lucio Costa in his plan had thought he could design this for. Now, some people have moved into the, there has been some development in the interior at the edge of Baja da Tijuca in an area called Jacare Pagua up here. But most of Lucio Costa's plan in terms of its egalitarian purposes was never developed. And this turns into a giant high rise uh, global suburb. And here's what it looks like today. So there you see the double barrier reef, which is a highly delicate ecosystem. Uh, and unfortunately, when you start building on it and putting in concrete um, and you uh, jeopardize the reef, the fragility of tidal flows that nourishes the ecosystem here of animals and the way in which these sand dunes and, and the whole ecology of this area works, 
Uh, also, when you start dumping sewage into these waterways without having sufficient protection, that's also going to create contamination. That's a huge problem that's getting worse all the time. And you have sand dunes and very delicate, fragile uh, ecosystems all around here that are also being jeopardized. So the environmental pro uh, problems of building a global suburb in this highly fragile ecosystem are only just beginning. There's been a lot of work to try to figure out how to get, uh, basically the government set up a sewage uh, system where individual condominiums were on an honor system. They were required to build a sewage system, which they did, but they didn't always have it working. So uh, it's a lot cheaper, I guess, to uh, not have it working 365 days a year. And as a result, there's a lot of contamination that seems to be leaking into these ecosystems, causing many, many problems and a future crisis waiting to happen. Not to mention the erosion of these fragile lagoons and the loss of uh, marine life and eventually possible um, endangerment of the whole environment of this area. So as, a, as an environmental project, Baja da Tijuca is extremely controversial and many, many problems waiting to happen. As an urban design problem project, it's also got a lot of problems. And I'm illustrating some of these here. It's a very fragmented urban plan. Everything is separate. The high rise developments are separate, medium rise condo communities, the beach commerce zones, office complexes, shopping malls. It's almost impossible to walk anywhere within this massive giant community here. Everything is oriented toward cars. It's literally almost dangerous to cross some of these highways and streets in this neighborhood. And something that's really missing that was um, you know, reported in one of the studies early on was that they got rid of some of the richest qualities of the streetscape of Rio, which was the, the, the street corners and these wonderful sort of bar restaurants that, um, that are often located on these street corners called bochequins, neighborhood bars. So uh, one study wrote, Baja is the only neighborhood in Rio that does not have a celebrated bochequim, mainly because there are no street corners where one could build one. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a, a real loss in terms of its urbanism. Um, the opposite phenomenon that occurs here is that the, the automobile really dominates. So every restaurant you go to, you almost can't arrive by foot. It's all cars, it's dominated by automobiles. That's how you get around the city. Um, there are a few public spaces to walk. And as I mentioned, it's dangerous to get from one lo location to another. Uh, it's full of highways and cars moving very quickly. Um, it's also very isolating. Uh, it's very privatized. People arrive in these buildings by car and they park in the basement underground and then they take elevators to get to their homes. There are many shopping malls in Baja da Tijuca, enormous numbers of shopping malls. Uh, so um, there's this idea that sociologists have written about, about this sort of cultural ideology of consumerism. The idea that consuming has become such a powerful force in our everyday life. And so we see this phenomenon in the shopping mall landscape of Baja da Tijuca, of this suburb of Rio, in the sense that literally the names of some of the shopping malls and the kinds of stores that one finds there have uh, show the influence of North America, the Hard Rock Cafe, uh, a, uh, various other words in English, skate parks and so forth. And this is a kind of odd irony that the name of this mall is Chita America, so uh, Italian, American city in Italian. Um, so there's sort of this interesting kind of linguistic uh, confusion going on there as well. This is one of the um, more infamous, uh, unsuccessful uh, shopping malls that was created. It's a good example of sort of fake uh, scenography, creating a mall that's kind of a Disneyland, a theme park-like space that tries to show um, different architectural renderings of different parts of the world all in one small shopping mall space called Baja World Shopping in English. The name of the mall is in English. Uh, and uh, this sort of fake scenographies of different sub areas within the mall, the Middle East and Europe with the Eiffel, fake Eiffel, Eiffel Tower and the sort of um, fake uh, French mansard architecture. Um, this mall, from what I've heard, was sold and I'm not sure of the status at the moment, but uh, it hasn't, it's very isolated, it's far from everything and uh, is, is, is a uh, one of many 
spaces, separated spaces in Baja. I thought it was ironic in one of the malls I was walking along and they actually has a shop called the Fast Shop. So, um, you know, fast urbanism is alive and well uh, inside the shopping malls as well. And there's been, I mentioned a lot of work on sprawl and public health. And so you're seeing a lot of ads on signage in Baja de Tijuca talking about um, taking care of yourself in clinics for, you know, uh, for plastic surgery and facial surgery. That's become a huge booming industry in wealthy neighborhoods uh, on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro. This whole idea of, um, you know, using technology to um, have this, you know, uh, to, to do something about uh, bodies that are being destroyed by living in sprawl neighborhoods. Um, they built a, 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 a performance space called the City of Music, Cidade da Musica. But it's the, uh, the use of the word city is questionable because it's in the middle of uh, a highly auto-centric part of Baja da Tijuca. The only way to arrive there is um, by car. And they say that they're going to connect it to a transit line, but uh, uh, and they say it'll be connected to other public places where people can walk to. But at the moment, it's very, uh, very car oriented. So I'm not sure the city of music is the right term to use for this place. Um, a lot of the communities that are um, sort of being built as Baja de Tijuca spreads further down, remember they saw that, that map of the long linear coastline, as they build further and further out down that coastline, these neighborhoods become less and less, um, they have no identity at all. They're just buildings in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and nobody, if you ask someone where you live, it's hard for them to describe where they live other than the name of the building uh, or the address. So to sort of um, finish this section of my talk, uh, you know, I asked the question, what does a global suburb mean in the 21st century? And is it a sustainable model for urbanism? Um, there was a political power struggle over that particular part of Rio. I, I didn't mention this, but I do mention in the book that at one point, as Baja da Tijuca was being built, social groups in the city of Rio went to the government and said, we want to be guaranteed that some of that neighborhood will be allocated toward affordable housing for other income groups. And the government, the mayor's office said that they would look into that. And, you know, five years later, nothing happened. There were protests about the development of Baja de Tijuca. But in the end, it became this global suburb, highly socially exclusive. Um, surveys have shown that people that live there move there because they're afraid of crime, even though there's also crime sometimes that occurs there as well. Uh, and that people like the shopping malls. And that was sort of what attracted to them. Uh, to that neighborhood. Now, uh, what I want to end here with is kind of going back into the city, into the urban neighborhoods of older parts of Rio, and asking the question, are there lessons that we can learn from these core neighborhoods that might teach us how to build new developments in places like uh, outside of Rio in the future? So when we go back, I want to talk about sustainability and placemaking in the city of Rio de, Rio de Janeiro. And I'm just going to borrow from uh, some work by the Project for Public Spaces, uh, which talks about what are the um, elements that define a great place. And they define those elements in terms of activity, comfort and security, image, designing to stay, triangulation, accessibility, flexibility, and uniqueness. There's so much about existing neighborhoods in Rio. Uh, I've spent you know, the last 10 years uh, spending part of the year in Rio studying the original neighborhoods and then contrasting that with the areas of that I wrote about in my book Global Suburbs. So one of the things that they talk about uh, in the pro project for public spaces is this idea of the power of 10. Of if you can have a, a public space that has different things to do, kiosks and cafes, trolleys, bistros, uh, markets, um, Rio has all of that. Um, the traditional neighborhoods of Rio, um, pictured in some of these photographs, you have the kiosks of Copa, uh, Copacabana, uh, very colorful with these wonderful uh, tile, mosaic tile designs um, inspired by uh, Roberto Burle Marx, one of the great landscape designers from Rio. Um, you see these in different parts along the beach. You have these old trolley neighborhoods, the trolley, which uh, is uh, very much part of the older part of Rio. You've got these uh, various, um, everywhere you go in the city, you see these 
these nature markets all over the city um, and these outdoor spaces, outdoor and indoor marketplaces and restaurants. So there's a lot of activity that could be part of this different kind of urbanism. Um, and the idea that um, the image that attracts people to certain areas is defined by having signage and tables outside and this open air feeling, which is so fundamental to Rio um, and nature, uh, the trees and the forest, which comes down into the city, making people feel like it's okay to walk here. To me, that's, a, that's, that's, that's one of the powers. This is um, the idea of designing to stay. This is a, um, a former estate that was donated to the city of Rio. Um, and it invites, it's an old, um, it's turned into an art school and a cafe. Uh, so it's a, a you know, place for students to come and study, a place for uh, local people to come and just enjoy this, um, this space that, that also incorporates uh, the, the uh, stunning landscape of the jungle around it. Triangulation and interaction. Um, there's nothing more interactive and dynamic than a street market. So I think the street markets of throughout the city of Rio de Janeiro are very powerful places that really, um, you know, this is something that, that shouldn't be left out of any kind of urban development project. And accessibility, one of the great things about, um, you know, walking to an older neighborhood like Copacabana here, um, the wide boulevard, um, pedestrians feel like this is for them. There is a street with cars on it as well but it feels very protected. So people who are, uh, and then they built these kiosks here to make people feel like they, they, they should come and stay here. Even if you're not going to the beach, you can come sit down, uh, you know, have a coffee, have a cerveja, uh, just enjoy the experience of being in this space. Uh, and it's buffered by, from the traffic by this very wide boulevard, which is also quite beautiful because of these mosaic designs. So a great space. Uh, Fred Kent and Project for Public Spaces would say is a place that you can get to easily and feel safe when you're there. This is a great story about flexible spaces. I think this is a, <clears throat> a, 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 a very powerful lesson that we're learning in urban design, urban planning today, is that the more we can make our spaces flexible, the more we can um, create better urbanism. So this is an older neighborhood in Rio called Umaita. It's a middle-class neighborhood. <clears throat> It also has favelas around it, up in the hills above. This was a warehouse for um, goods that were delivered to supermarkets in the neighborhood. And little by little, a couple of restaurants opened up on the edges of the warehouse and people liked coming here. So eventually it became, the warehouse part of it was moved elsewhere and it became a kind of a neighborhood center. It's called Cobal de Umaita. So the merchandise warehousing aspect of it kind of fell away and it became a, bit, a place of supermarkets, restaurants, uh, cafes, uh, specialty shops, and it has an inside and an outside. And on the outside, one of the things they've done is this, this is actually a parking lot. So during the day, people can come and park their car here, but at night, the cars go away and they move all these chairs farther and farther out and this becomes a giant gathering place. It's become extremely popular. And I think it's one of the success stories of how to create flexible urbanism in high density neighborhoods. It's a, it's a concept that's being copied in other parts of Rio. Um, so another thing about great urbanism is uniqueness, right? And I talked about this, the street corners and the Boche Kim, um, which is literally in a, an open air space with food and, and coffee, uh, things to buy, very colorful. This is in a neighborhood called Flamengo in downtown Rio. So it's very alive. It has the awning so you can be protected from the sun. So this kind of urbanism and, and uniqueness creating, you know, obviously this is a beautiful, uh, uh, colorful street with a lot of different buildings, uh, interesting buildings, but it's the uniqueness that draws people here as well. So a few other examples of what I call sustainable urbanism. Um, so Aldo Leopold wrote this book back in 1949 called about land ethics. And he, he talked about uh, the idea that um, people, there should be that, that we have social ethics in our society about relationships between individuals within a society, but we don't have a land ethic on how we relate to nature and to the land. And so I think that uh, one of the things that Rio has is a lot of potential places 
where the, 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 the physical environment can be much more incorporated into the urbanism of the city. And of course, the Jardin Botanico, the Botanical Gardens, which was also an estate of um, uh, the Portuguese emperor who came, Don Juan and Don Pedro, who came to Brazil uh, in the 19th century. And they used this Botanical Gardens to study plants. And eventually it was donated to the city. And it's this wonderful public park that's part of the city. And I think, you know, great public spaces allow people to connect with the local ecosystem and feel part of it. And I think this is something that Rio does a pretty good job of. Um, you know, it doesn't feel exclusive to me. Anyone can get into the Jardin. There are places in the park where they do charge money, I think, to go in the cafe. Um, but in general, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity, I think. And there are a number of places like this in Rio where people have access to the land and to the physical environment. Um, there are a lot of public gardens in Rio, uh, inside museums or inside other government buildings. There is this attempt to try to integrate the in interior with the exterior. I think that's really important going forward in the 21st century. Um, better cities uh, are, you know, better ecological models uh, involve this kind of connection between the interior and the exterior. So. Um, Public patios, I already showed this one. Um, but there's even um, nature and this is the, uh, the, the there's three uh, modern art museums in Rio. The first one, the MAM, Museo de Arte Moderno, uh, was uh, built in the 60s. And it has a huge outdoor area as well where nature is very present. So even though you're inside the museum viewing art, you can step out onto these esplanades and you're immediately uh, you, you, you experience nature and the, the tropical uh, environment of Rio. So I think that's really powerful. And, and I think that idea of connecting the interior and the exterior in different ways, in different socioeconomic levels could be a very powerful force going for, forward. Um, this idea of public space and water. So this um, humanly constructed giant Lagoa Lake, which fills underground from streams, um, it's interesting to me the way that the city of Rio has embraced the lake and created a lot of urbanism that touches up against the water with uh, pedestrian walkways and outdoor eating spaces and um, play areas and um, you know places for children to be along the waterfront. Um, and it's pretty open for the most part. So it feels to me like um, the city could do even more with embracing the waterfronts and making them more public. I don't think they've done as good a job in Baja da Tijuca. There's a lot of exclusive spaces along the waterfront. There's a river that runs through the old part that doesn't feel accessible and it's got freeways now along it. Uh, one of the nice things about Lagoa is there are no major freeways uh, anywhere around Lagoa. They've done a pretty good job of protecting it. There are some you know, well-traveled roads along Lagoa, but they're you know, two lanes on either side. So it's not, They've never allowed any freeways to be built along this, and that's you know uh, a positive um, thing for the city. This is another phenomenon that I found very interesting that I've written about um, is this idea of celebrating um, public spaces in cultural events. So um, you probably know about uh, Carnival and Carnival in 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 Brazil is you know world famous, and most people. When they think of carnival, they think of the samba parades, which are wonderful, and the samba schools. And there are 12 samba schools outside of Rio, and they have these incredible um, cultural rituals that they go through each year before the actual performances in the uh, samba stadium, right, the samba drome. Um, but something that a lot of people don't know about is this: is there's an, also an organic celebration that occurs during Carnival that is completely unrelated, well, uh, is, is, is disconnected from the more commercial Samba Parade. The Samba Parade, you pay, you know, like $100 and you go and watch that for eight hours and it's an incredible thing, but it's, it's a parade and it's, it's inside of a, a, a formal space. There are these organic block parties or block uh, street events called blocos, that have become explosive in Rio. Um, there are literally are 
um, you know, dozens of them that occur each carnival season. And now with the internet, everything's announced online and they range in size from a couple of thousand to 150 to 200,000. So people go to these blocos, they're announced during uh, uh, the week of uh, carnival. They're announced what days and what time they're gonna occur. And essentially people meet, they start in a small, a uh, square and a park somewhere and then musicians usually play and they start to you know wander down the street and little by little people show up on the street and then the blocko usually lasts about two hours and then they always have a final place that they end up in so this is a photograph i took at one of the blocos in an older neighborhood called santa teresa and it ends at this giant uh square in the center of santa teresa and people just stay there and there's food and music and lots of um, you know, enjoyment of this festival. But what's interesting to me about this in terms of urbanism is this is people take using the carnival and uh, rejecting the commercialism of the Samba parade where you pay to go inside a stadium and rather having a free event where they take back their city, they take back their neighborhood. So these are people from the neighborhood inviting everyone to come and celebrate carnival in their public space, on their streets, in their neighborhoods, uh, all over the city. And this has become a huge phenomenon. Literally millions of people are going to the blocos of Ipanema, Copacabana, downtown, hundreds of thousands of people showing up at each one. It's become this massive phenomenon. And I think it speaks to the role of culture and, and identity in designing spaces that people can use in different ways, but also in people taking back their own neighborhoods, which is a point that I'm gonna um, you know, emphasize uh, again. So the, the street markets I already mentioned, they're called Fedas, very, very colorful places. And they also celebrate the, the nature Again, because this is all locally grown produce that's being sold here. And um, people know that if you go at the very end, the prices go down. So when they're trying to get rid of their products, the last hour of the market uh, on whatever day of the week it is, there's always some good discounts available. Um, there are also what I call periodic cultural niche markets throughout um, Rio. These uh, so-called hippie fair in Ipanema is famous, started out uh, that local craftspeople who made different products, musical instruments, et cetera, would sell their goods. And it became so popular that it's sort of become commercialized now as a place that tourists like to go as well as locals. A lot of diversity in what's sold on the street. Um, the uh, uh, cold uh, coconut juice, the coco gelado is uh, something that you see everywhere. Um, many, many other products as well. And then the, these open spaces, um, so a couple of days a week now they close off the streets and the entire coastal area uh, is only for walking. So there's one one lane for cars all the way up on the left side of this slide, but the entire promenade and most of the street is only for walking. So cycling, walking, skateboarding, etc. but no cars. So this is celebration again of pedestrians. Uh, and the sense of place and identity in the form of new uh, projects like these kiosks, which were rebuilt at the uh, Copacabana uh, waterfront to um, add more vitality and identity to that particular neighborhood. And then the idea of architecture as public space. So you have this museum across the, uh, the bay from downtown Rio in a place called Niteroi, um, designed by Oscar Niemeyer, who was the architect of, uh, of most, many of the buildings in Brasilia, the national capital. And I, what I found interesting about his building is that the outside space is just as interesting as the in, inside space. So a lot of people like to come and stand on this curving uh, walkway just to enjoy this unusual feeling of the building while it, which looks out over the bay, obviously a beautiful uh, location as well. And then um, these modernist housing projects where there's a lot of public space for the people who live there, all of this area that was created here, gathering spaces for people living in these projects and the kind of organic design. The most famous one is the Pedregulho housing complex by the architect Alfonso Heidi uh, in another neighborhood in the North Zone, but also the way in which this building kind of uh, mimics the curving feeling of the uh, hillside here where it's located. So, um, and then of course, downtown being revitalized and all these great historic spaces 
and the colorful buildings as well. So a couple of final thoughts here as I come toward the end. Um, I want to you know, clarify that we cannot forget the social problems embedded in cities like Rio, favelas. I was not researching favelas. Many other people have done excellent work on that. But I'm looking at the question of sustainable urbanism and these new peripheries and the global suburbs like the ones that I wrote about in my book, um, they're actually competing with favelas because they're gobbling up land that could be used for uh, helping communities that need more housing and more access to space. So there's definitely value in rethinking the kind of peripheral development that's being, that was, that's being built in cities outside of cities like Rio. And I think one of the things is to go back and embrace the lessons of the city's traditional urbanism um, and also recognize the need to focus on equity. So I want to just say finally that I, it seems to me that a lot of the best qualities of Rio's urbanism speaks to issues that we're hearing in urban planning and urbanism more generally, you know, sort of the idea of slowing down, slow cities, uh, cita slow, slow food, uh, walkability, emphasis on the local, historic preservation, traffic calming, ecological restoration and community values are all things that I think are very much there in the landscapes of traditional Rio neighborhoods and was somewhat forgotten in this rush to build this new modernist high-rise protected enclave suburb that doesn't have some of the better qualities of Rio's neighborhoods that could be part of how we think about those communities in the future. And I'll end with this. Um, there was, there's been a lot of popular protest movements in Rio in the last few years with different leaders, um, people going onto the streets and I think this idea of community empowerment and slowing slow neighborhoods, which is sort of this idea that neighborhoods embrace their own ecosystems and try to um, create a set of urban planning and urban design policies that are maybe slower, uh, but also speak to the needs of the community and community empowerment. That idea needs to be embedded in the future construction of communities in places like Rio. Um, and politics that allow p communities to have political power, I think are going to become vital to <clears throat> cities like Rio, um, really embracing their future. So thank you very much. I will end there and open it up to questions. Excellent. Thank you, Larry. Um, great, uh, great talk, I think. Uh, um, yeah, with so many issues, um, uh, Describe today. I just want to uh, maybe share uh, something that our dean Butzer he had to leave. He had a two p.m. meeting, but uh, he said, you know, uh, thanks for being here, Larry. And uh, big questions about who owns the city and decisions on who gets to guide its development and evolution, relevant to Latin America, Africa, and eventually to parts of North America, and important to address now. So he says, uh, gives his thanks. Uh, for being here. Um, I'll open up to questions. Um, and uh, I think there so, was something in the uh, um, there was a question. There was something in the um, in the chat. I don't know if that was. Oh, just you letting me know that there were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that's the other thing. So I'll open it up to questions. Um, so I don't know. Uh, Sarah, do you want to begin with a question for Larry? Since you were the host of Larry. Yeah, um, wait. I currently am thinking of one. I'll get back to you. Okay, we'll open it up to, to anybody else. Uh, questions for Dr. Herzog? I see someone else turned on their, um, their video. I don't know if that's a question. I'll ask a question. Um, it seems like when we, especially when we discuss urbanism and kind of where we went wrong and what we're trying to get back to, it's real easy to blur the distinction between the architect and the developer. And a lot of people are like, architects can do this, architects can do that, but they're not actually the money people. They're usually hired. And so, you know, one of these questions is the government can't be the one building everything. Um, but it seems like, especially when you're talking about neighborhoods um, kind of reclaiming ownership and a change of politics is that people can make 
the especially developers are going to be able to make money any which way they want. It's just not giving them carte blanche to do it. And it's about the cities and these communities putting restrictions or things on what can be built. That seem, it, it seems to me like that is probably the best direction to, to kind of help reclaim these neighborhoods and give them a much more authentic feel. Is, is that kind of the direction or I, I don't know, like what's the, uh, like, like how do you accomplish it? You know, what, what's the, you know, how do you, how do you, it's a great idea. How do we actually realistically get it done? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, no, that's a great, you, you, you make a couple of really excellent points. First of all, yes, I, I agree with you that the developer, the architect is not the developer. Although in Latin America, many times architects um, <clears throat> do become developers. I think Renee could speak to that phenomenon in Tijuana. Some of my friends in Tijuana who are architects are also developers. So there has been a, a, a pattern in certain countries in certain places where um, architects become developers precisely for the reasons that you're talking about, Brock, is that, that they feel frustrated that they're, they're not getting projects the way they want them. But in general, you're also right because um, it takes a lot of money to be a developer and um, architects don't necessarily have access to the capital necessary to, um, to do these large development projects. So that's a really important point. Um, you know, I wanna, I just wanna suggest that like there's this thing called natural capitalism, which I'm sure you've heard of. It was actually a book written uh, called Natural Capitalism. And the argument of, of, of that book and other, other people who, who are writing about it is that um, being environmentally uh, conscious can actually be profitable. It's not the case that you know, ignoring the environment is always better. There, in, and I think in a place like Rio, particularly in Rio, it's completely ridiculous to me. I, I, was, I, I was taken on a tour by some colleagues of mine, geographers from um, actually from Canada and from uh, the US who were doing work in Brazil. And they, we, we did a tour of Baja de Tijuca and we were looking at some of the older neighborhoods there. And we were looking at these um, beautiful kind of water, waterways that run off the edges of those lagoons that you saw that were just being destroyed. They were just being, you know, um, you know, the developers were kind of bulldozing them and building concrete, and it was obvious that they were destroying part of a marsh or part of a, a very uh, fragile ecosystem uh, for no reason. There was no reason to put some of the stuff that they were putting in there. They could have done it differently with a little bit more thought. So I think ecological preservation does not always equal less profit. So that's the first paradigm we have to recover from. And I agree with you as far as community empowerment. Um, and in, it's complicated in Brazil because um, you know, the ways in which government functions really vary between regions and cities. There's a lot of complicated politics. And right now there's some you know, very significant problems going on at the national level with the pandemic out of control. Uh, and that's really got people's attention. But um, I think that you know, one great solution to me in the future is the power of people. And I've seen in Brazil, I've been, you know, I've been in Rio and I've seen, you know, the power of people, you know, protesting certain things or, um, you know, running for office. I think you're going to see a lot more women in Brazil running for office. There are some really brilliant uh, women in places like Rio and other cities. And I think the future of good, uh, good urban design is what I see in the universities, incredible smart, determined community activists and people who want to change things who are not going to accept um, the situation that's occurring. And I, you know, I think they're learning how the system works and they're, you know, going to be the, they're the, the next wave. Uh, we just need a little more time for them to get a little older so they can get into positions of power. But it's a difficult question that you raise and I don't have great answers. Um, <laughs> But I have seen some individual examples. Like I was really impressed. I showed you that example of Cobal. That was a community inspired project where it was a warehouse and just kind of organically, it started to create these little restaurants originally for the workers. And then people in the neighborhood started going there and all of a sudden it turned into something else. And then at some point recently, 
someone was going to try to buy it and turn it into a shopping mall and the neighborhood protested and they won. So I think that when the people are well informed and when they're invested in something that affects them, that gives me hope that there is this, that community empowerment is possible. Uh, but it, it's a complicated story, no, no, no doubt. A great question though, thank you. Thank you. I think we have um, room for one more question. I think we all already kind of went over our, our the period of class, but I want to open it to one more question. So uh, anybody? Um, I maybe have one. Um, so I was wondering, you were talking about suburbs and how to develop them in a sustainable way. Do you think that we can reach a model that we could apply to the different suburbs? Or is it more about um, searching for a good recipe to produce them? That's a great, wonderful question. Really, really excellent question. Um, so I think the answer is a little bit of both. I, I do believe in, um, I, you know, when I teach urban design, I always teach my students that you have to grid your design specifically to the place that you're designing in. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in, you know, we've been in a pandemic for a year, but I always want my students to go out in the field and look at the place, the site and the neighborhood and really get to know the neighborhood and understand the neighborhood. Because I think neighborhood identity and neighborhood ecology is really the name of the game, right? But as this slide that's up on the screen here uh, suggests, there are certain principles that I think need to be followed. And, you know, they are things like uh, promoting walkability, um, you know, co traffic calming, community values, promoting slower forms of transit, walking and cycling. You know, there's a lot of literature and books coming out on these things. Um, and the old model of suburbs, the United States model of, you know, low density, car oriented, cookie cutter type suburbs, we know that that model isn't good anymore. And yet, in fact, it's still being built in some places, which is sad. So I think the principles of, you know, slowing down of historic preservation of ecological restoration, traffic calming, walking, cycling, um, we have in San Diego, um, we have a guiding plan called the City of Villages. You can look it up on the internet. Uh, I was on the uh, one of the uh, advisory committees for the city of villages, and the city of villages basically said, "Enough of the suburbs. The suburban model doesn't work. We need to go back to the idea of a village. We need to rebuild our communities so that people can walk in them, slightly higher densities, uh, create more public spaces, create more oppor local opportunities, more jobs at the local level. Um, you know, and this is across the board, wealthy." poor communities, we need to create village values, right? So that idea, those, those, those models I think are, are important. Then how you apply them in different locations really depends on what's going on ecologically, what are the fragile ecological elements that we need to respect? Um, what kind of topography are we dealing with? What is the history of the community? What is the ethnic composition of the community? Who are the existing cultures that we should respect? All of those things need to be taken into account. And that's how I teach urban design. I don't think urban design is a one size fits all. I think it is about understanding the local and respecting. And also I think we need to ask people who are already there what they want, which is not done enough. We need to do charrettes and community uh, you know, focus groups and ask people, what do you want? What, you know, I love going into communities and doing charrettes. I've always been uh, big on that because I like to hear what people think they want. And it's amazing that people have those skills. So, you know, that you ask a great question and I hope I answered it. <laughs> great. Well, like I said, I'm going to sort of end it, end it here. We went already a little bit over, but it was a great conversation. We could continue going with Larry uh, uh, for another hour for sure. And I want to thank him. Uh, thank you, Larry, for, for this great informative, uh, really eye-opening um, I hope, I wish you could do this one in Spanish as well. We could, we could do it in Tijuana. Uh, I would uh, love to, I would love to do it in Spanish uh, or Portuguese. Or yeah. both, you know, so, I always so, like to air out my Spanish. <laughs> I was going to say that, that at the beginning of my talk, I was going to tell you that uh, I'd much rather, you know, that we're in this pandemic, so we have to do the Zoom call, but uh, 
I, I was, it reminded me of the, the saying, vence, pero no me convence. <laughs> you know, like we're stuck doing this, but it's not really what we want to do. So, um, right. you know, yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to um, do the, the Spanish version sometime soon, Rene. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Larry. And I think uh, also everybody who was here, uh, you know, our students and also the people who joined us from other, other parts of the world, I guess. Uh, thanks for uh, keep coming. And uh, we having, we're having our last lecture of the series, which is uh, next Tuesday, uh, a good year. A good dear friend of ours, Larry knows him very well, Tito Alegria, for, uh, who will be talking about kind of a more general, kind of, he's going to summarize a little bit kind of the, 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 the world of Latin America for us. Uh, so there'll be a nice ending to these specific cities that we've been talking about. So thanks again, Larry. Thanks, everybody. And, thanks, uh, everyone, for coming. Nice to, see, nice to meet you all. I would have much rather done it in person, but uh, I'll save that for another time. Excellent. Okay. okay. Cheers. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Bye.